And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Mariana and I were very fortunate to purchase a home in 2019, right before the price of everything turned to gold. As you know, the housing market is literally insane right now. Uh, but if you have purchased a home, you know that there is a lot of paperwork involved. There are contracts to be signed. There are silly things like due diligence, down payments, mortgages, home inspections, insurance. And it becomes quite an ordeal just to get that key in your hand, no matter the price of the home. We successfully purchased our home almost five years ago now, and evidently there was one piece of information we overlooked. The HVAC unit was basically brand new when we bought the home, and it had a warranty on it. But when the house is sold, you have three months to claim that warranty as the new owners, otherwise the warranty is void. Somehow, between the due diligence, the down payments, the mortgage, the home inspections, the insurance, and finding a U-Haul, we missed the warranty on our HVAC unit. And our compressor died about three weeks ago, as most of you know. And because of the fine print, we missed out on a free compressor. Most of us are not people who read the fine print. We are the kind of people, if you're like me, that you see the 84 pages come up on the screen and you click, yes, agree all, I've read it, sure have, check, what's next? We usually don't take time to read all the stipulations of those agreements, and sometimes that can come back to bite us. Today's text might be thought of as the fine print, the terms and conditions of following Jesus. Are you sure you want to follow Jesus? Have you read the terms of agreement? Are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into? The disciples apparently did not know what they had gotten themselves into. If you look at verse 31, as the text begins, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Jesus has been wrapping up the Gentile mission uh, and moving on to these more intimate encounters, personal teaching moments with his disciples, as Jay talked about last week. Um, he is preparing for this pinnacle moment in history in which he would go to Jerusalem and ultimately to Golgotha to be tried, rejected, and crucified as a sinner. And he wants to make sure his followers are well prepared for what is about to take place. Jay preached on Peter's confession last week, which was like the highest point in Peter's career, right? You are the Christ. Who do you say that I am? Well, you've done everything in Isaiah 35 that said that would happen. You healed the deaf and the blind. You healed the lame and the mute. You've calmed the storm. You've treaded the waves. You've cast out demons. You've brought children back to life. This isn't Elijah. This isn't John the Baptist. You are the Christ. We need to remember that Mark is well-versed in the Old Testament. Mark has been intentionally, though subtly, 
pointing us to Old Testament passages alluding to these themes in the Old Testament to prove Jesus' messianic authority and deity. And if you know your Old Testament well, you know that the Messiah did not just come to heal people and do a bunch of miracles. That's one part of it, right? But there's more to the story. Peter was ready to confess Christ based on all Jesus had done so far, but he hasn't read the end of the story. So Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. He must suffer. He must be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes. He must be killed, and after three days, he must rise again. Jesus doesn't just say these things will happen. The Son of Man will suffer. The Son of Man will be uh, killed. No, he says he must suffer many things. And he said this to them plainly. This was not a secret. This was the plan from ages past. This was the fullness of time taking place. This was the master plan of redemption written by God himself to save the world by one man's death. Suffering was always a part of that plan, and Jesus was not shy in discussing it. This is where we're headed. We'll see in a minute that this was nowhere on Peter's radar. He makes a pretty good fool of himself in a minute, doesn't he? But the reality is it may not be on your radar either. Our king came to suffer. We follow a suffering servant king. Genesis 3, Jeremiah 23, Isaiah 53. The Son of Man must suffer. He must suffer to fulfill the prophets. He must suffer because it's the only way to pay for sins. It's the only way in which sinners could be saved. He must suffer. Maybe you're visiting with us today. You came with a friend or family member. This is what we refer to as the gospel. This is what we mean when we talk about God sending His Son to live a perfect, sinless life on our behalf, to die on a cross as if He was a sinner, and then to rise from the dead to be Lord over sin, death, and hell. The death and resurrection is the bedrock of our Christian faith. This is what it's all about. If y'all were in Colossians, was anybody here not in Colossians? We had, we had a good group this morning. We have like 99% participation. I love it. Y'all keep coming. This is what Colossians is all about. Without the cross, we have no salvation. Without Christ as our substitute, we have no atonement for sins. Without the resurrection, we have no Savior to forgive our sins and make us new creations. This is the good news that Jesus came to be killed and to rise again three days later on our behalf. Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe this truth that Jesus really did suffer and die and rise from the dead? And not just do you believe it as a historical fact that it happened, but do you believe that His blood has the power to cover your sins and to forgive you of all unrighteousness? Do you believe that this Savior can reconcile you to God and has reconciled you to God? Have you ever confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord? You can be saved. This is where following Jesus begins, right here. He must suffer and die and rise again. If you get that wrong, you're going to get everything else wrong, right? You have to understand the gospel. Of course, there's more to the story. If you really want to follow Jesus, you do need to read the fine print. What does it mean to follow Jesus under the heading of his death and his resurrection? I've got three points to guide our time today. Set your mind on the things of God. Deny yourself. And do not be ashamed. This is the fine print. The first one, set your mind on the things of God. Look at verse 32. So he was saying this, this to them plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Have you ever been in a class or some kind of group setting uh, where you're all working on an assignment of some kind and you just mess up real bad? And the teacher comes to you and sees how bad you messed up? and then says to the rest of the class, don't do that, right? 
This is pretty much what happened to Peter today. Um, this is uh, what I did to Josiah in Core Doctrine today. Uh, <laughs> it's embarrassing. And this is, this is Peter, J Jesus uses Peter as this example because Peter thinks he's doing something right. He takes Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus for this teaching. Lord, you can't suffer. You can't be crucified. No way. I'll take out my sword and defend your life right now, which he did later. Poor Crispus, right? Was that his name? Cut off the dude's ear. Uh, he, 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 he was ready to fight for Jesus. Peter thinks he's being a loyal hero, but he is very wrong. So verse 33, Jesus looks at his disciples first. Like, y'all, y'all see what's happening right now? He looks at everybody else and then rebukes Peter. In front of the whole class, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Just one passage earlier, Jesus uh, or Peter was confessing Jesus as the Christ. And now Jesus is calling Peter Satan that quickly. Peter thought he understood the Messiah until it came time to suffer. So Jesus says, class, don't do what he did. Don't be like that. He's got it wrong. Why does Jesus call him Satan? That seems like a bit of an overreaction, doesn't it? I've never been called Satan. I've been called some stuff. Thankfully, I've not been called Satan yet, and definitely not by Jesus. This is pretty much the worst insult in the world, to be called Satan by Jesus. Um, why? The answer may surprise us. When do we most look like Satan? According to this text, we most look like Satan when we are setting our minds on the things of man. That is satanic, Jesus says. Consider the ministry of Satan in the Gospels. Of course, you know, we have these incredible cosmic warfare that, that's going on like maybe never before while Jesus is on the earth. Only the Lord knows how many demons he cast out and um, removed from oppressed people during his ministry. But the most telling ministry of Satan took place at the very beginning after Jesus' baptism. Jesus went out in the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days, right? This was in Mark, very small portion of Mark, greater detail in Matthew. Jesus went out in the wilderness among the wild animals who also showed up. Satan, the prince of darkness, grim. But what was Satan's goal in the temptation of Jesus? Satan's goal in tempting Jesus was to steer him away from the cross, to steer him away from suffering. Again, Mark doesn't record it, but we know from at least three temptations that, that came to Christ by way of Satan in the wilderness. First, he says, if you're hungry, because he was fasting, turn the stones to bread, just eat those, right? No big deal, you're Jesus, just, just turn the stones into bread. If you're suffering, just eat. Second one, why don't you just go up on the top of the temple and throw yourself down? Because your angels can catch you, right? Don't you have angels that the Lord will command concerning you? Won't God deliver you from peril? He won't let you fall. And finally, just bow down and worship me. Consider all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. It could all be yours if you worship me. You can exchange the cross for worldly glory. Doesn't that sound appealing? To trade your suffering for fame? And Jesus finally says, Be gone, Satan. That sound familiar? Very similar to what he tells Peter here. All of Satan's temptations had to do with Jesus exchanging suffering for worldly treasure. And I think many well-meaning preachers and teachers have said that you know, Satan wanted Jesus to go to the cross, not anticipating the resurrection. Like, if we could just kill him, then he would, probably couldn't rise from the dead. I don't know. Satan would mess that up. No. Satan did not want Jesus to go to the cross, right? This was the plan before the ages passed, that God's beloved son would die on a tree to save the world. His plan was to steer Jesus away from suffering, away from the cross. This is what Satan wanted. And instead, Jesus says, turn your minds to the things of God. Turn your minds to the things of God. Satan's best strategy was to deter Jesus from the cross, away from the things of God, away from the things of man. 
This is what Peter was doing to Jesus. If Peter was in the wilderness, he very well may have taken Satan's deal. What are the things of man versus the things of God? I think just based on the context, the things of man are a life without suffering, a life of worldly pleasures and treasures, a life without the cross. Jesus tells Peter and all of us in a moment that if we are to gain the world and all its treasures, we would have to lose our souls. This is what Satan wants, for us to gain the world and lose our souls. But the things of God, this is what the Savior requires of his disciples, to turn our eyes upon him, his glory, his kingdom, the fulfillment of these things, salvation. To turn our eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face, while the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus is not insensitive to our suffering. Jesus is not saying you need to suffer and get over it. It's that he suffered first for us, more than any human ever did, when he took up his cross and died a sinner's death and bore the full weight of God's wrath. Jesus suffered first, so we could follow in his footsteps, joyfully as redeemed people. We suffer knowing he suffered for us. To seek a life free from suffering is not the way of the cross. It is the way of Satan. So Jesus says something really cool that I've never seen before in this passage in the Greek that we might miss. Um, Jesus just told Peter to get behind me, right? And then he calls to the crowd in the next verse and says, if anyone would come after me. That's the same phrase, get behind me and come after me. But it has two different meanings. We can either get behind him as Satan, or we can get behind him as a follower. Jesus is saying this is how you become followers. This is the fine print. Number two, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So this is when Jesus turns to the whole class. He says, y'all, don't be like Peter. He messed up. This is what you don't do. You want to follow me? You want to go with me? You pick up a cross to follow me. This is the center of what it means to follow me. If you would come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Again, same phrase as get behind me. So if you're coming, you've got to come this way. Any other way you try to come is satanic. Anything else is worldly. These are the terms of the agreement when it comes to following Jesus. Deny yourself. That's the first thing he says here, the first term. The way of the cross is self-denial. To follow Jesus is to die to yourself, your will, your desires, your self-centeredness. Life is not about you anymore. Life is about denying yourself. Life is all about the cross. And the picture is vivid. Jesus says, take up your cross. Because Jesus is picking one up himself. He will be hanged on it. Are you going to pick one up too? You see Jesus picking his up. Where's yours? Everything within us, in our nature says, no, I do not want to willingly lose my life. I do not want to willingly take up a cross for someone to crucify me on it. That's against our nature to say, yes, I want to pick up a cross. I want to die. We are wired for self-preservation. Why would anyone willingly die? Because Jesus died for us. Jesus was going to the cross. In order to follow him, it would take radical self-denial to come after him. But remember, we're so used to talking about the cross in our context, we forget what it was, would have been like to hear it in their context, 
right? We wear crosses around our necks. We sing songs about the glory of the cross. We talk about the cross-centered life. John Piper reminds us how they would have heard this teaching. For Paul to say that we should boast only in the cross of Christ is shocking for two reasons. One is that it's like saying, boast only in the electric chair. Only exult in the gas chamber. Only rejoice in the lethal injection. Let your one boast and your one joy and your one exultation be the lynching rope. No manner of execution that has ever been devised was more cruel and agonizing than to be nailed to a cross and hung to die like a piece of meat. It was horrible. You would not have been able to watch it, not without screaming and pulling your hair and tearing your clothes. You probably would have vomited. Paul says, let, be, let this be the one passion of your life. The other shock is that he says, this is to be the only passion of your life, the only joy, the only exultation. Where did Paul get that kind of doctrine from? Mark chapter 8. To the rest of the world, this sounds foolish. But to those who experience the power of the cross and have themselves gone from death to life, this is glorious. This is a kind of self-denial that is not achievable but by the enabling power of the gospel which changes us from the inside out which gives us new desires, new affections, that steers us away from self-glory and to Jesus' glory. If we must die in order for Christ to be magnified and glorified, then we must die. This is the kind of people the gospel creates. Our minds are no longer on the things of man, but on the things of God. The second term, the way of the cross is the only way to Jesus, he says here. Jesus makes it clear there are no other ways to get to him. Why must the Son of Man suffer and be, be killed and rise again? Because this is the only way that sinners can be saved. This is the only ordained means by God to save the world. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus is saying if you choose the cross, you have to understand that all other options are off the table now. If you choose the cross, there's no other ways. There's no other religion. There's no other God. There's no other act of service or good works. Nothing but my blood and my cross will get you to my Father. You must renounce the worship of anything else for the praise of the Lamb who was slain. You must deny self and deny all other counterfeit gods. It's the only way to Jesus. It's the only road. To Jesus, and it's a one-way road to Jesus. Imagine the picture of, again of, of a man who picks up his cross and starts marching toward Golgotha. Everyone watching around knows he's a goner. We're never going to see that guy again. He's not coming back. There's no U-turn. There's no exit ramp. Once you march toward the, the hill, with the cross on your back, it's over. This is no return. Following Jesus means we will never turn back. And the third term of the agreement is that you will lose your life. Lose your life, Jesus says here. This is how we deny ourselves, by losing our lives. And what Jesus is doing is setting up a transactional situation. If you choose to save your life, you'll actually lose it. Um, if you lose your life for the gospel, you'll save it. Your, your life is going to be lost one way or the other. Your life is like money. What will you spend it on? If you spend it on the wrong things, your money will be wasted. It will be lost it will be gone, down the drain. But if you spend it on the gospel and his name, your life will be saved. What he's saying is, you're going to lose your life one way or the other. Lose it on the things that matter. Lose it on the one thing that will actually save your life. Put it this way, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? 
Your soul is what you have to spend. What will you invest your soul in to turn a profit? If you invest your soul into the world, he says, you won't get any return. What gain is there to give your soul to the world? The world is not profit. The world is cheap. It will eat through your bank account until there's nothing left. What in the world could actually be worth your soul? What could someone give you in return for your soul? Jesus says there's only one thing worth the price of your soul, and its dividends are eternal. The one profit to pursue is the gospel. The cross is profit. The cross is gain. The world is cheap. The world is empty. It will leave you broke. It's like spending a million dollars on a candy bar. It's like Esau selling his birthright for a bowl of soup. Don't do it. You're selling your soul for nothing. Don't buy what the world is selling. Come to the gospel. Give your life to this. This is how you save your soul. Philippians 3, Paul's own testimony. Whatever gain I had, whatever worldliness I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I lost it. It was a waste. Indeed, everything I count as loss because now I know the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or am perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Is that your testimony? Is that your testimony? Or did you say a prayer? Signed a card? Went down the altar at VBS? Or did you get rid of the world in order to purchase the gospel? Did you sell all that you have and count it as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowledge, knowing Jesus is your Lord and Savior? This is the good news of the gospel, that there is something better, there is something to gain besides what the world has to offer. We can have Christ, and this is the one way to save our souls. The cross is profit. It may not feel like it some days, and it certainly doesn't look like it some days, but I encourage you to not give up. Keep running toward the prize. Keep pushing toward the electric chair. Keep striving with all you have for the pearl of greatest price. But we ask, what does that profit actually look like? What is our reward? What have we really spent our souls on? Jesus answers that in the final term by warning them of the nearness of the kingdom of God. He says, do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. Look at verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this, adulterous gen uh, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. He said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. General rule of thumb is you try not to get too deep on the last point, but we're going to get a little deep, okay? You can't not. Did y'all read what we just read? Okay? And you heard our scripture reading today? There's a few different ways to look at these verses. You can disagree. There's some different whatever views on it. But I think Mark is calling us back to the Old Testament again. What did Jesus say when he began preaching in Galilee? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? Right? That means it's here and it's coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's here and it's coming. 
The kingdom of God has already started. You just don't know about it yet. One day, you'll see it in its power, and you won't be able to unsee it. So from an Old Testament perspective, we go to Daniel 7. Daniel has these crazy visions of the beasts that we read about coming out of the sea, stuff you don't want to have in your dreams. And then Daniel looks at the center of heaven, and he sees the Ancient of Days at the center of heaven. And who is presented before the Ancient of Days? The Son of Man coming on a cloud, right? Cool, good stuff. Um, and this is what Daniel says he sees. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. What is Daniel describing? I don't know what he describes in a lot of that book. But I think at some points he's referring to not the final judgment, but the ascension of Jesus, which we read in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus, the conquering lamb, risen from the dead, who has now defeated sin and death and hell, is now ascending to the right hand of the Father in glory, this is Matthew 28, all, all nations and tribes and tongues, a, a d dominion that will not pass away, a kingdom that will not be destroyed. The Father has now given him a name above all other names through his resurrection. And so what's Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, I'm not going to be here very long. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this generation, I'll be ashamed of you when I'm clothed with splendor in the glory of my Father. I'm going to see him like real soon. And I'm just going to tell him everything. Right? I'm going to tell him who was ashamed of me and who worshipped me. There are some standing here who won't taste death until they see the power of the kingdom of God, which is a sign of urgency. This is how close it is. The power of the kingdom of God, I think, is when Jesus left and who came with power but the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, as Peter preached, the gospel was made known to all peoples, nations, and languages, speaking in different tongues, being able to understand one another. And the disciples uh, standing before him there in Mark chapter 8 were also there when they saw the kingdom of God coming in power in Acts chapter 2. John 14 says, these are indeed the greater works that they will see. So we did our theology. Good job. Check. Now what? Even though the Holy Spirit has come, Jesus has ascended back to the Father and has all dominion and authority to try every tongue and nation. We still aren't there yet. The kingdom of God has come and is still coming. The kingdom of God is what we're waiting for. We do await a final judgment in which Christ will return and once and for all rule and reign over the whole earth. His glory will cover the place like the waters cover the sea. A new heavens and a new earth is what we are after. But until then, Jesus is commending only certain people to the Father right now. He's telling his father who is not ashamed of him. Who does he commend? Who are those who are not ashamed of him and his words? Those who are ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of them before his father. So we must decide now if we're ashamed of Christ or whether we will boast in the cross of Christ. The fact of this adulterous and wicked generation that he mentions here means that those who are not ashamed of him will be the minority. There will be great pressure for us to turn away from the cross, to be ashamed of the cross. But Jesus urges us not to because heaven is a cross-centered place, and that's where we're going. In heaven today, the Ancient of Days sits on his throne surrounded by hundreds of thousands of tens of thousands of thousands of thousands of people who are not ashamed of God of the gospel and of Jesus. That's what heaven is like. You want to know what heaven's like? It's everybody who is never ashamed of Jesus. And that's where we're going. It's a cross-centered place. The cross is the anthem of heaven. And we long to join that song. And if we do long to join that song, then the cross must be our anthem here on earth. Jesus is not looking for good people. Jesus is not looking for people who go to church and wear nice clothes and do nice things for people. Jesus is looking for people carrying a cross and who are never turning back, who are not ashamed of him before men. These are the followers of Christ. These are the ones who have read the fine print. 
The greatest crisis in our day is the multitude of people in the Bible Belt who have prayed a prayer, walked an aisle, signed a card, and they do not know God at all. Satan has kept their minds on the things of man. There is no fruit of the Christian life that they can be known by. They wear the name of Jesus, but have purchased the world and lost their souls. Who are you? Have you found all the gain of your soul in the lamb who was slain? Or are you after the cheap gains of the world? We must decide. The time is short. What are you spending your soul on? The reward for one is a soul that is lost. Not only lost, but will be shamed and rejected by God in the end. The reward for the other is that Jesus will not be ashamed before you, before his Father. He will welcome you into eternity with more blessings and riches you could ever imagine. He won't be ashamed of you. He'll call you his own, and your soul will not be lost. So either we will come after him as a follower, or he will say, get behind me like Satan. Have you read the fine print? Do you know what you've signed up for? Is your mind set on the things of God or on the things of man? Are you denying yourself and carrying a cross like Jesus did? Are you ashamed of him before men? Do other people in your life even know that you're a Christian? That would be a good question to meditate on this week. If they don't, why not? Have you decided to follow Jesus? The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cross that you carried in order to teach us how to carry one for ourselves. And thank you that you carried it first, that you suffered and died and bled and rose from the dead, that we might be justified and sanctified and glorified, that we might become a new people with a profit that the world could never give. Uh, help us to suffer well for the glory of the cross. Help us to not be ashamed of the Savior. Help us to turn our minds to the things of God while we follow you until your kingdom comes. In Jesus' name, amen.